Hello and welcome to uh, this Open Senses webinar. This is the third in a short series of webinars where we've been focusing on what work like, might look like post-pandemic and how some of those changes in work are going to impact organisations as they look to support work in the future. My name's Chris Moriarty and I've been your host all through this series as we've, as we've explored this topic. And in episode one, we spoke about the macro trends and, and how might uh, they impact workplace design, human resources, and corporate real estate generally as industries. Uh, in episode two, we went a little deeper. We spoke to two practitioners in major brands who are navigating these changes and heard some of the practical implications and challenges that they were facing, as well as some of the lessons that they've learned along the way. Now, if you've missed those two, don't worry. Um, you can find them in the resources section on the Open Census website or on their YouTube channel. Go back, enjoy them. Um, but what's coming today? What, what can we bring you today? Um, so as you might expect from an Open Census webinar, we're going to talk data and the, and the role of data and the importance of data. Um, now, I'm delighted to be able to introduce today's uh, panel who are going to help us explore some of these themes. Um, so we have uh, Steph Welch, who uh, is the head of FM at Arab, uh, and she's been there for more than a decade. And in 2020, she was voted uh, manager of the year at IWFM's glittering award ceremony. So uh, high praise indeed. Um, we're joined by Ian Ellison. Now that Ian's someone I've known for a long time, a self-proclaimed not so secret agent of workplace change, um, who's moved from in-house FM teams through to academia and onto consulting. And finally, we're joined by uh, Open Census CEO and recently voted uh, in the 50 most inspiring women in technology, which is a hell of a, clay, a hell of a accolade to get, Yoda Stanton. Um, so we have a consultant slash academic, we have a practitioner, we have a data expert. So we are well stocked when it comes to exploring this topic. So Ian, Ian, I want to start with you uh, in terms of looking at data. I just kind of want to set the scene really for, for people that have joined us. Um, you've been, as I said, in, in the kind of uh, intro there you've been in sort of various different roles in and around workplace and fm for a while and that's given you a series of different perspectives um, and i'm thinking particularly in recent years you've done some work for the institute of workplace and facilities management that looked at this from a kind of almost um observing platform and see what's going on i just wondered what's your kind of take generally on how data and the role of data has kind of changed morphed evolved in our landscape uh, and and perhaps you know maybe in the last couple of years is a bit of a focus for us okay well good afternoon everybody good to be here um i think to kind of start us off let's talk about let's just frame workplace so that we can talk about data so when i say workplace and you don't all have to agree but I'm, i sort of use it to refer to the spatial stuff the people and culture stuff and the technology stuff all of the tools, the way we go about doing our job, wherever we're doing our job. So to me, when I talk about workplace, and if you're going to ask me questions about workplace data, that's what's going in, on in my head. So how's data changed or, or how, how has it changed? I think the first thing to think about is, you know, certainly from a narrative perspective, it's clearly more important than ever because you know we've been through this kind of almost trends of phrase isn't there over over time you know there's big data there's artificial intelligence there's cloud computing there's SaaS stuff all of those terms point to the fact that there's so much more at our fingertips from all these different workplace angles but the big challenge is you know having the ability to gather data being able to switch something on to get more information is one thing something that perhaps hasn't changed as readily and i'm sure we'll get into this later in the conversation is is the ability for us to do powerful things with that data and use it to influence organizational practice yeah no and i i think that's probably there's two things in there which is the scope of data and the power of data and I suppose there's a tendency that we all say data is important because that's kind of drummed into us, but actually the right data is important. Steph, I, I kind of want to bring that to yourself there because I, I guess from someone who certainly on paper is coming from the kind of space aspect of what Ian's just talked about, how have you seen as someone in an organisation dealing with colleagues and, and looking at, I guess, at experience of employees, particularly in the last couple of years where it's, it's become really kind of uh was put under the microscope because we're you know organizations are really concerned about it now um how have you seen this kind of 
blending in of some of the other data points that Ian's talked about, like HR data, like tech data, because I would I would guess that five, six years ago, uh, people in a kind of corporate real estate type role were only really looking at building data and and some people data that might be about you know movement and usage and utilization. So have you have you seen someone who's doing this day in, day out? Have you seen that kind of influence increase? There's definitely been a shift. I would have said previously um, data still wasn't being used. Even the building data wasn't being used the way it should have been. There wasn't necessarily the drive for the occupancy data that maybe FMs wanted. People didn't really see the need for it. If somebody said, we need more desks, we need more desks. You tried to showcase that they perhaps didn't need those desks, desks due to um, holiday sickness, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it wasn't something that anybody was really very interested in. Now it's far more about what people want, what people think, coupled with the data that you have for people attending, um, and also an awful lot to do with well-being data as well, what people feel that they need. And I think that's very much um, a hot topic at the moment. And, and I, I guess that's what we're seeing here is that, that that kind of thirst for data is being driven by sort of major organizational challenges, right? And organizations, what they care about. But I, I'm someone that's been in around particularly the facilities management profession as part of this kind of landscape. I've been in and around it for a long time. And there's this sort of sense that it's a, it's a profession that is overlooked, that the work is not as valued. And I suppose every profession has got a version of this conversation going on somewhere. Um, but ro what role has data played in that kind of additional interest that we're getting now on some of the topics you talked about, particularly about, you know, the kind of post pandemic usage, um, and well-being they're two sort of real hot topics for us at the minute um it's great news i guess because someone will come and talk to us and get engage us and want us to get us involved and stuff but what role has data played in in those conversations has it has it accelerated stuff has it complicated matters has it not been an issue because the drive for the topic's been there how how's how's data kind of fallen into some of those conversations i think it's a lot to do with the clarification of data so we we obviously want very accurate valid data we want to prove that that data is accurate and it's giving the correct picture um, and i think as we started to reopen it was expected that that data would be there in the format that people needed whereas the investment hadn't been made previously so although there had been drives to do this it wasn't acknowledged now it's absolutely acknowledged that yes we need to know that we need to know whether we need more space do we have enough space do we have too much space um, and our, is, is the space that we have actually meeting the requirements of the people that want to use it, the people that aren't coming into the offices, perhaps because they don't see a need, if it's just a desk that you're offering, they've got that at home. So it, it is very much at the forefront. It is useful data, but there is an awful lot more that we can do. And I think there's an awful lot more out there that can be had, but it has to be um measurable and it has to not be a data dump it's not so we've got people in our offices who just want the data well please just give me the data the data is not clean and the data is not accurate then it's not going to give us the picture that we need so we need to finesse it and we need to make sure it's right and comparable with other areas as well to give the bigger picture that's really interesting now um yoda you and i on a previous episode of this series you talked about how this kind of spike in interest during the pandemic, there was a lot of questions being asked, which is a great thing in a sense, if we're gonna take any sort of positives from what, what's been a very difficult time for a lot of people. For us as a, as a community, it's nice to be asked these questions and have the opportunity to do it. Um, but I, I, I'm kind of interested in how data and the interest in data was happening pre pandemic, because it was already building up some steam. Not clearly, if you've, you know, you've set up a data company, so you must believe that as well. But just talk us a little bit about where that 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 kind of interest in data was heading and and what role the pandemic had on the trajectory of that that interest yes it's been it's been a really interesting time whilst the the pandemic obviously has seen a major shift i i believe what it's actually done is accelerate a lot of things that were already happening with activity-based working um people had already recognized pre-pandemic that, you know, 
if their employees want to work remotely for a certain amount. Um, the people were playing around with person to desk ratios and, and kind of collaborative spaces and, and really kind of the conversation around, I suppose what everyone now is talking about hybrid working, that, that was already being had, the debates were being had, the, um, the resistance was possibly like at management levels and so forth, but I think the industry in terms of the workplace industry had agreed that this is where it was going. Obviously, this change has been accelerated by force. <laughs> um, probably we've 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 gone, you know, we've fast forwarded now where, you know, instead of that gradual shift of, of um, natural transition, it's it's just happening. Um, you know, the surveys that we did uh, for the employee surveys showed that the majority of people want to work um, from home at least half the week, if not the majority of the week. Um, so the, the, for me, what I've noticed is just an acceleration and also an awareness and things that were not necessarily a priority before, such as indoor air quality um, data sets have now accelerated again because we, we know about the impacts that COVID has um, in terms of using, um, if there's not enough fresh air and so forth, so people are using, you know, things like CO2 as a proxy. Um, and, and also I think employers recognize intrinsically that they need to show people that the space is safe not you know they need to demonstrate it so there needs to be kind of clear indicators that they're proactively showing that these spaces are are, are safe and, and bring people comfort and, and and that's that's something we explored with patrick and derek in our previous episode which was this employee expectation and demand has sort of shifted and just very quickly, Steph, have you seen that in, in your organization that suddenly, you, you know, I think someone described, uh, I was on another another uh, call uh, with someone, I was doing a podcast episode actually, and they were saying that maybe in the past someone might have come to you, Steph, and gone, it's too hot, it's too cold in here, quite blunt bits of feedback. But now they go, they want to know what the, the air quality is. You know, people are using this kind of the phraseology that they've heard on the news and stuff. Are you, are you seeing that in, in, in practice? Yeah, I saw only an email yesterday that had come through asking for that information. And previously, where we may have done air quality testing, uh, we already luckily had seen that there was uh, a need for this pre-pandemic. So right. the new building that we are moved, well, that we is is add in addition to our current portfolio, um, that has lots of air quality sensors in there. Whereas yeah. the existing buildings, it's something that you do on a six monthly basis or a yearly basis. So you've got your main plant and you know that you're testing from there. But to actually have the continuous, continuous floor information is not something at our fingertips. And that's becoming more and more important. It's really, Ian, I, I kind of want to bring it to you and talk a, a bit more almost philosophically about some of the, the bits we're talking about there and then then perhaps if you've got some examples from some of your clients you can sort of bring that in uh, because what we're what strikes me is a, as someone who's come from the world of marketing you know my background is sort of marketing comms uh customer experience and all that sort of stuff and and you know we we had the big data explosion in in uh, marketing about a decade ago where we could and it's the stuff that we're all very used to now like you know google tracking us through our websites and what we click on and what we share and all the rest of it, you know, there's every, every part of our digital lives is kind of encoded. And I'm, I'm kind of feeling now that that's coming into our world of, of workplace experience and, and FM estates, HR, all these aspects, this sort of employee digital persona is, is generating data points all the time, which is exciting, right. But comes with challenges, right. Cause we've now got lots and lots and lots of data and that's not really enough to have it right indeed yeah i mean it's been interesting listening and sort of reflecting as you go you you start something like this saying i want to talk about this this and this and you end up with about 10 minutes going actually i want to talk about that that and the other thing what i was hearing as folks were talking was there's almost this partly because of what's happened in the past couple of years but partly because of it, it it's the technological in, uh, enhancements allow us to do this more complex work situations require more analytic capability to be able to make sense of them to be able to make better decisions and it's funny because we we've locked in we always lock into this this data term but 
if you've been on any sort of management course about data and decision making and stuff like that, one of the first slides in the entire deck is, is that very classic model, which is data, information, knowledge, wisdom, and we clag decision making onto the end of it because data is only in service of making better better organizational decisions right for whatever reasons it needs to be for so so we are we, we have this wonderful opportunity to gather so much more to make so much more best decisions but then I almost want to now immediately become devil's advocate because I think as an industry with all of this enhanced capability it's really easy to hoodwink ourselves into we're just going to stroll into the boardroom with with armed with these reams of better insights and they're just going to believe us and they're just going to do what we need them to do and it couldn't be further from the truth because no amount of data in the world turns turns us away from the fact that quite often facilities management is the poor relation or workplace folks can be the poor relation and quite often we're the we're the one walking in with the bad news saying here's the evidence that you need to close that building here's the evidence that you need to start sharing instead of have your own desk here's the evidence that says this that and the other so we can do amazing stuff but it's more than just being armed with data it's kind of the stuff that wraps around it and what you do with it i guess i guess that the danger of the amazing stuff and Yoda, I'm going to come to you in a minute to talk about some of the amazing stuff that we can collect now because I think it's really exciting and interesting but we're in danger are we not then of thinking that having the data is almost part of the solution it's like you know we've got this now well it, it is part that'll of solve the, it all it is part of the solution but it's and it's not it, it it's part of the solution it's not yeah. the full solution you said earlier you said you know maybe share some client examples or some, you know it's kind of like we're into case study world the most interesting dynamic in one of our consultancy gigs at the moment is when you you know it reams of different data really rich insights from organizational perspectives from building perspectives from employee perspectives really rich data set which is pointing out particular ways to act that will be in the best interest of the organization and the best interest of the people and how then the workspace fits into that and it's it's shaping to become a really lovely solution for this organization the biggest challenge is when you walk into the boardroom, so to speak, virtually these days, and you meet um, you meet perspectives which are immediately challenged by the data that's being presented. And then, then you get into this little wrangle. And Anthony Giddens wrote about this in the 1970s, and we see it every general election when the two, when the whoever many sides are arguing with each other, no amount of, of evidence necessarily shifts entrenched perspectives so there's the, the power of the data is phenomenal i'm not doubting that but it's how we then stretch and use that to our advantage in different ways so it, what we're saying is it's kind of a tool to be used as opposed to a, a solution now yoda you'll be working with lots of different organizations that'll be using data for lots of different reasons i i wanted to ask you two questions and, and you choose which order you do these in right um, and I suspect take take the proper question first, which is how how what's the sort of the best use of your data that you've seen organisations do, and, and and have you been able to witness kind of change off the back of your data? That'd be really interesting to look at. The other thing is, and just I guess for me, it's just about curiosity about where we've got to. When you get you know once you've done that, tell us what is the perhaps the most surprising, oddest, coolest, whatever way you want to frame it, piece of data that you, you guys collect as part of your thing? Because I kind of get this impression as well, there's stuff being collected that no one has any idea about. And you sit there and go, wow, we're, we've got that to that level. So perhaps start with a grown up question first and then follow up with my very childish question that just wants to look at shiny things and get excited. Okay. Um, <laughs> the So, I, and I agree, I, th I think even, as a, you know, kind of, I've, I've been dealing with data for 20 odd years um, and people get really, really excited, like, you know, kind of, but the hardest part is actually having all this stuff and no questions. The questions are the critical bits. What are we going to ask the data of? And then we can go, what data points do we need? Um, and, and really kind of, I, I think, Again, this kind of the maturity conversation. As, as an industry matures, you you see the initial excitement, and then you see kind of the use cases being bedded down. 
Um, for example, if you, uh, for, for, for those, I, pretty much everyone is, is obviously moving into kind of some bit of hybrid working. Great, you need data, you need to understand, you know, how many desks, how much collaboration, so forth. From the, the, but you also need to speak to your employees, right? Like you need to ask them questions. And yes, you do surveys, but really kind of just taking a subsample of, of and, and asking in-depth questions. And what are they not happy about and so forth? Um, once you've got the kind of the direction in mind, you start framing the questions and then you start running experiments and and and, and I think that's the, the methodology is what I'm seeing people need to develop next. I think that's the next level of maturity, having kind of much more of a scientific mind rather than I'll take this bucket of mess and I'll try to do some um, graphs and then some answer will pop out, which is, it never happens, but it never goes that way. Um, so for, for me, I, I think we need to, as this industry moves forward, we need to talk much more and share best practices um, and, and have some consistency in mind. Um, if we get it right, I actually can see uh, a world where you know people are happier, more productive, and also you know kind of the wastages that we've seen previously, and we, we're going to see uh, going forward if we don't change in the way that we approach it would would be um, would be minimised. Just I just want to jump in there quickly because there's something you said there about methodology, and I think that's really really interesting because I I you know I've heard people talk about. Um, that you know the, the whole workplace needs to be more scientific and i i always suspected the people that say that tend to be people that are selling you data solutions right and i think there's a tendency to think science equals data and you know with with our academic on the panel uh, who could probably do a whole webinar issue uh, episode on its own about kind of some of the problematic um that problematic viewpoint because it's not as straightforward as that um one thing that always struck me about science is that and comparing it to workplace projects and uh, you know tell me if you think this is sort of the thing you're, you're kind of getting at is that there are in a total workplace experience there's loads of levers that we can pull there's loads of cogs that are turning there's so many variables and factors that are going in but quite normally and Steph I'm going to come to you shortly afterwards because you've, you've gone through I think something similar recently with big workplace change projects you're changing all of it you're changing everything now if you were going to be very scientific, you would change parts of it and see what happens. You would go, right, we're going to just change this tiny variable and we're going to start to understand the impact of that variable. But with workplace projects, we tend to, there tends to be a lot of change all at the same time. And something might have worked. We don't know what, and we don't know how to keep an eye on it. And, and so is that kind of what you mean with like the methodology now needs to be the next evolution? Is it that kind of that kind of very structured approach to this is why we collect it. This is how we collect it. This is what we do after we've collected it. Here's how we use it. Is that, is that what you're getting at? Um, yes. Yes. Uh, and it's, and it's, and it's also recognizing that one data point in itself is not, it doesn't just work um, in a vacuum. So for example, people monitor CO2, but what we do know is actually, if you monitor CO2 at certain times versus when utilization is higher, um, utilization and CO2 are, are linked if your HVAC systems or your kind of um, air intake systems are not performing as well. So it's not just, let's just take a sample set. It is like for every person that comes in, how, you know, how consistent is CO2? Wow. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I guess what you're saying here is that if we start looking at data points in isolation, we might go, oh, that's interesting. But what you're saying is that and we're getting into I, I can see Ian get very excited because we, we what we're getting into is kind of like the difference between causation and correlation um, and all that sort of really exciting stuff. Now, I I would worry that the, the, that brings in a kind of skills bit as well. Just quickly before I, I take it on to, to Steph quickly, what's the coolest bit of data you collect what would you say if you were going to like be at a dinner party in some sense what's the coolest bit of data what are you going to get out of your locker what's the fun bit um i to be honest all sensor data is quite boring but i'll tell you a cool <laughs> quote unquote ceo open sensors <laughs> <laughs> you know, no just, i get it i get it well, 
Um, there was a there was recently um, a study that was released by a university in Netherlands, and it was really really interesting the co cognitive performance impact of particulates. So you, right. you particulates, fine particulates like PM two point five. When it so they took kind of um, air quality and and um, uh, individual players within chess, and they measured their cognitive performance. So if it, when particulate went up by um, 10 points um, in an indoor environment, um, the, play, the chess player's probability, probability of making an error went up by 26%. Wow. And that's the cool kind of data use case again, that we really, we haven't, we talk about kind of fluffy productivity numbers and well-being and, and in quite abstract terms I, I find um but you know for most organizations that are kind of very um you know they brag about how they get kind of the smartest people we, we work with the smartest people and so forth and these small indicators that they don't look for are actually shaving a huge amount of their cognitive abilities of, of people um which i found is interesting so that's the kind of coolest nugget so that's a really interesting answer there, because I suppose what I was uh, I was looking for is like some sort of laser that did something that told me how many bugs there were in a square mile or something like that. You know, there's something you go, wow, you can do that now. So like real techie, geeky stuff. But actually what you're saying is that, and, and to qualify that kind of comment you made at the beginning, I guess, data on its own, like if you said to an organization, we can measure your particulate counts, they go, oh, okay. Um, and it reminds me, I used to work with someone who worked in the civil service. And when they briefed ministers for communications, the minister's got like three minutes to learn an entire policy or whatever. And the, uh, and the aide would go rattling through it and, and say, here's three things that you need to keep mentioning. But they were trained to say at the end of it, this is important because. And that's, I guess what you're saying is we can measure particulates, but that's important because did you know? And I, I guess, Steph, going to, to you now and... and so I mentioned about a workplace change project. So you had the, um, you've recently, you're in the middle of a, a move. So it might be interesting to, to look at some of the data points that have been used as part of that kind of broader project. But I kind of want to talk about, I want to touch on something you said and something that that is going to be our kind of next area of discussion. Um, just before I get into that, folks, as well, don't forget you can put your questions to us in the Q&A. And I'm getting fed them. So we're going to come to those questions at the moment. But Steph, you said about, we can collect all this stuff. But then he started making some points about the quality of it, the cleanliness of that data, the usefulness of that data. And it just got me to thinking that such is the kind of thirst and hunger for data at the moment, particularly from leaders of organizations in inverted commas. Is there sometimes a bit of a challenge where you've got people that are really, you know, maybe they've been to a conference where they've seen that paper that Yodit's mentioned and they go, right, particulates are the most important thing now i'm going to go to steph's office and find if i can get some particulate data and you, you kind of want to almost cool your jets because that we're not quite ready yet so how do you know because i guess you're sitting there, you really want to take that opportunity to to have that conversation but yeah. sitting there again we're not quite ready to do it how do you manage that kind of balance stakeholder engagement that's, <laughs> that's it but i just wanted to go back to the point ian made about taking data into the boardroom and expecting it to to do more than perhaps you to, to have more of an impact than perhaps it can um i want to take it back to the people that can't get the data so the fms that don't can't get the business case together to get people to realize how important the data is so that's the first stumbling block and then to have the data is really useful um i completely agree with what you're saying trying to pull people back and i i had some feedback just the other day and i'm arranging a meeting to speak to, to speak to this person because they want this data and they want it now and they want but they don't realize that we may have it but it doesn't tell us anything at the moment right or is it accurate so with the new bill that's the transition that's happened with covid and you, you know data that perhaps you didn't use previously that you've had at your fingertips you're now trying to bring them in to to uh, verify them and to to look at them as a collective yeah um with the new building yes we've got lots of different tech in there i'm very excited about it there's also a work that we've done with the property insights team because i want to see the data as a collective 
So I want to see the capping system and I want to see the electricity usage and I want to see the lighting system and I want to see the heat maps and I want to see it on one thing. So we can say, okay, yes, all of the meeting rooms are always in use. Oh, actually there's only one person in each room because we've got the, the people counters as well. Or one of our very clever people has managed to ascertain how many people were in the room down to the CO2 sensors. So it's all of that different collective information that paints a bigger picture. Whereas if you just look at the meeting room usage, it says you need more meeting rooms. Right. If you then look at it with the other data, you actually say, no, we don't need more meeting rooms. We need a step change and people need to stop using them as offices. Or we need a lot of smaller rooms that people can just jump into as a two person. You know, really simple stuff. But if you just look at that one, you know, that yes, that meeting room's in use. It doesn't really tell you anything. Uh, what, I, what I find really interesting that it always makes me think stuff like this always makes me think of Del Boy Trotter and him. Yeah, there's a line that he says in one of the episodes where he says, um, what can't uh, what can't speak can't lie. Um, and I, I guess that's true in a sense if you if you go and look at a situation and and observe it. But actually, we are, what we are saying is sometimes it can because if it's not lying, it's certainly masking a truth because it's quite a blunt bit of data. And actually, what's really important around these data points is not to do away with these data points. It's context, right? Because I, I who was I speaking to recently? Um, I, I was speaking to an organisation, and they were getting sort of fairly blunt scores from user experience surveys saying, I'm not happy with the meeting rooms. And they were sort of ticking, yeah, I'm not happy with that meeting room. And, and that's the kind of tools that we've got at the moment that kind of rate this out of however many, you know, away from the stuff that your team's doing, you know, which is kind of atmospheric. And I'm using that as a very loose term, but yeah, I can see what is happening here because a body just walked past me or this temperature has been registered. But that kind of experiential data that you're talking about, Steph, because that's the stuff that's going to end up in your inbox. That's the stuff that's going to end up in the boardroom. Um, away from maybe sort of financial stuff but that yeah it was sort of saying that meeting rooms are um we're not satisfied with them but then the other data said well they're being used all the time so you're sitting there going, well these two things don't stack up mm. and then you find out like you said it's because the person in the open plan office has got nowhere to use their telephone so they go and sit in the meeting room and that's not what they're for so there's kind of like this level that we tend to operate at which is very high level and very blunt data but actually there's a whole body of insight underneath it that we're not really tapping into at scale you can walk around and see this or talk to a few people mm. but you can't do it at scale right absolutely and going back to the other point that you made about you quite often will do a big change so it will be a refit a refurbishment that's when the new tech comes in yes and you do change a lot but with the the new technology that's out there or should i say the technology that's been around for a while that's now being embraced you can get a bigger picture so we've got lots of different um settings lots of different furniture and that's the people counters are going to tell us which areas people are using the most it's also going to tell us how long they're staying in that space as well. So it's not just that, it, that, you know, it's footfall. It's like, well, actually, they're going to sit down there. They get some work done. They like that. Maybe only maybe only 20 percent of it's used, but it's still well used as opposed to somebody going that space is never used. And you yeah. can't verify that and you can't show that. And also there's an aspect of being a little bit frightened of end users having data. Because especially in this company, we have a lot of very clever people. Yeah, of course. Yeah, very informed audience, isn't it? Absolutely. And they want to know everything and then they want to interrogate it. So there's that nervousness around it. But actually, when you've got this big floor plate that's showing people the temperatures in different spaces, no longer do I need to say, well, I'm really sorry, your desk is too cold. We'll do something about that. I can say, well, yes, this area is cooler than this area. From the heat maps perhaps depending on what temperature you prefer you could choose to sit in that space yeah yeah no i mean it, it, it's it's almost uh more data more problems in a sense isn't it because like it's that kind of little bit of knowledge is a bit dangerous ian just just sort of picking up some of the challenges that we've talked about with data particularly things like the richness and the scale of it is, is a, a sort of competing factors some of the stuff that steph's been talking about in terms of you know the almost the the um the responsibility that people have once they have data because it can be misused it, it was it, you know, to your point earlier on you were kind of describing data as a bit of a 
it's it's i guess it's it's a it's an uh an asset in either supporting arguments or or challenging viewpoints you know you can you can hold data up and say look you think this i've got some data that says otherwise let's have a conversation but it can be used the wrong way i've got a book behind me called how to lie with statistics you know it's a, it's kind of a it, it can be done so just just explore some of that some some of the kind of challenges with quality of data which might be because of the way it's been captured all the way to Yoda's point about methodology and then some of that kind of responsibility the power of data and the responsibility angle okay right well i think the ri- when you said the richness bit the, it, it took my mind back to what Yodit mentioned a few minutes ago, which was, you know, you can gather all the data or you could go and talk to people or you kind of need to do that as well. Right. Helicopter out. We're having a conversation so far essentially about quantitative data, about all of the statistical numerical stuff that tells us about building performance. Right. Going and talking to people, whether we whether we do it face to face, whether we do it through the, the text boxes on surveys or whether we do it in the tons more sophisticated ways we can do it now. That is data. It's just different data. It needs processing in different ways. It needs different skill sets, but it can tell us a bunch of stuff. And if we can do it, if we can learn to do it, if we can develop the technologies to do it at scale, then we can, it can stop being so anecdotal as well. Because one of those sort of criticisms is you can gather all this stuff through sensors and look, it's objective, factual stuff. And there's almost, a, you asked me to talk a little bit about power, Chris. There's almost a more powerful play in saying, look, our data is objective. But People are subjective, right? We have feelings, we have emotions. That's the whole well-being part of workplace, amongst other things. So we have to learn to understand that and talk about it with more sophistication. So we have to go there as well. So in terms of you know richness of data sets, I guess the thing that's popped into my head now is that sort of classic idea of we've got to understand at a surface level what's going on broadly but we've also got to develop the capability to dig in and go deeper and if we can then square that and go broad and deep with emerging technologies then all sorts of fun, f- cracking things can happen i've forgotten the other things you asked me because i got excited about that bit well it was responsibility like the misuse of of data you know it, it can almost if you let data get a bit wild and unruly, then people can use it for all sorts of arguments if they present a part of it and not the whole. Well, is it the data or is it the person that's presenting that's wild and un- unruly? Yeah. Well, this got me, whilst Steph was talking about presenting data and the challenges of it, I was thinking about there's actually almost like a, a piece of psychology around how we, the, the sort of the tricks of getting people in organizations at whatever level understanding and and embracing the opportunities of data in a more powerful way and some of them could be really simple little tactics like one of the things that we've started doing like many organizations we've developed you know or we, we you know we develop um sort of survey tools to take the temperature of how people are feeling on organizations about cultural stuff spatial stuff technological stuff But one of the things we do with the data sets that come out of that is we go, here are the findings. I'm going to give you them in advance. So that terrifying thing, Steph, where you're giving it to the to the to the users, heaven forbid. I'm going to give this into advance because I'm going to come back in three days time and I want to hear what you've seen and I want to hear what questions you want to ask of the data. And then we'll dig deeper and we'll come back to you again. And sometimes we even split the quantitative and the qualitative stuff. So the first reveals quantitative because that is the stuff that gets read right people read stories they read what they want to see sometimes into figures right that statistic says this which means this well it doesn't it's just a statistic what you're doing is you're perceiving a story in that so sometimes with the first reveal you can go okay have a look at that oh that's interesting so you feel like that do you right let's dig into the data so you do the deep bit next and when you come back again you go that thing you said you were bang on that hunch that you had about the statistic is represented in the richer information but equally you might go i know you're very important mr ceo or mrs ceo or whoever but i'm afraid that's your perception and that's not represented in the rich stuff the organization loves this or the organization hates this and your perspective isn't actually an outlier so 
it's the, the psychology of how you present and utilize and bring people on that data insight journey with you is really important as well. Yeah, I, I suppose what it's getting us away from is hot takes. You know, there's so many hot takes in boardrooms, right? And it'll be my, but I've never seen that or I don't do that. And oh, I, I think disagree that with that. Yeah, yeah. And that can be a, and that can be a tactic. One of the things that we've learned, uh, you know, during the pandemic is if somebody's uncomfortable with data, a barrage of questions in a boardroom puts you on the back foot. Yeah. A barrage of questions buys somebody else time while you're recovering. So yeah. there's an awful lot about our capabilities with data analysis, information, decision making, making recommendations, but also the reveal of it and how you bring it to life. Yeah. You, know, you know this as well as I do, Chris. We are a storytelling species. That doesn't mean that we use data to make up fabricated information it's not fictional story but how you reveal and you unfold so people can see what the data means to your point yodit the particular impedes cognitive performance right if you deliver that as a fact it has it registers in one way if you deliver it in a way that you're bought into the implications of that something else happens yeah yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I guess what we're talking about is a narrative that stitches this stuff together. Um, look, I, I want to come to some of the questions that we've had coming through. Um, and what's quite useful is that they're all in and around the same kind of topic, which means that this is something that's front of mind. Uh, and Yoda, someone who's been in around data technology for a while, and, and I should imagine that within your work now that these sort of questions come up, it, it, it's kind of about the sensitivity of data and particularly personal data. So things like areas like GDPR, which I, I find really interesting GDPR because it kind of mainstream data protection, didn't it? Everyone knew what GDPR because everyone in any business was doing a course on it. And therefore, it, you know, not it wasn't just kind of data geeks in the corner talking about it. Everyone was talking about it and had some form of awareness. So this idea of individual rights, you know, what, you know, particularly sensors, I guess, could be a bit, you know, a bit kind of sensitive, excuse the pun, um, because, People have said, why are you measuring me, monitoring, why are you following me around the building? What's this about? So just to, just explore for me or just explain for me how some of those sensitivities have changed over time and, and how we navigate that. Because people here listening today might be saying, this is great. I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to do that. But actually, my main problem is getting it through this team who are going to be worried about what I'm asking and why I'm asking it and all the rest of it. So how do, you, how do we approach that? What's the useful kind of set of tips that we can offer people? Um, so from our perspective and, and our company's perspective, we um, we wanted to assets, not people. So that's, I think that's the main approach and that's the one we always will draw the line against. So there will be no kind of, I want to understand your connection, your phone's connection to any um, local devices and so forth. We don't do that. Um, so from a, let's say, agile working activity-based working perspective, most companies, especially nowadays, they're saying that, you know, dedicated seating is not happening. This is, this is space that people share. These are touchdown spaces or meeting rooms and so forth. So in terms of the data from our, from our side, we stay very much away from individuals because it really doesn't matter, you know, if you know kind of john comes in you know three days a week or whatever it, it's the asset usage and ensuring that that is fit for purpose that that's the kind of those are the metrics that we measure for and explain that i mean very very clear what these sensors do because again and i call sensors boring because not because you know they it's a very interesting technology but the data points are very much like somebody was here you know, yes or no, it's very binary. They don't, it doesn't know who it is. Um, the counting data, again, is counting, counting lines say, you know, three people went in, two people went out. Um, environmental data tells you obviously the kind of environmental factors and so forth. And that's, I think that that's on the right side of the line to ensure that kind of, whatever the use cases are, they meet those challenges. Um, the moment it gets into individuals and their movements and, and you know, that's not something that anybody should do really. And it's, it's 
goes into the creepy territory to be quite frank is that the kind of rule of thumb steph is that the kind of uh you know if it's if it feels creepy it's probably not right is that well, probably yes i don't think i'm going to disagree there but then there are other aspects where you when you ask somebody's opinion when we first embarked on utilization software nobody the, the end users couldn't see the benefit of it because they had fixed desks because they didn't want to share because there was no ad, there was no agility there were a couple of groups that wanted to do it and they could see the benefits when it's then introduced without question because you need it for track and trace because you need you know not for, for fire safety first aid safety we're not going to use the whole building we're just going to have you in a particular section then people want to know when their colleagues are in. They want to be able to search where their colleagues are sitting. They want to go and sit next to them. Whereas when we asked that question four, five years ago, I don't want to be tracked. I don't want to be visible. What happens if I don't want to be seen? Not one person said that since, since we've been in a position where they can see the benefit. Now it benefits their life, then there's a reason for it. But again, we do avoid the personal data. That I think that's the only time that we we have the, that that person actually being able to be located is is that that point of data. I, I, I this always reminds me. If anyone's ever talk, seen me talk about data and seen me use this example before, apologies for sounding repetitive. But um, I, I remember years and years ago there was this kind of Facebook thing where. Uh, Every time you went on, people were like go into your iPhone settings and find this this setting and it's your location services and Apple's tracking you and ah, it's really scary. Stop it, you know. And I, I mean, I'm not one to put my tin hat on too often, but I sat. I thought, well, that's a bit off. But I'd forgotten about it. But then a few months later, I got that kind of alert that some of you might have seen, where it says you're about to make this journey that you seem to make every day at this time. Um, by the way, there's a bit of traffic, so maybe take a different route. And I was like, oh, that's quite useful. I'm going to leave that on now. You know, so sort of subconsciously, I said, actually, I'll leave that on because if that's what it's doing for me, fine. If, you know, if, if at the time Steve Jobs wants to know when I go to the pub and not, then that's that's his prerogative. But actually, I'm get, it's like an exchange, right? I'm getting something back. Um, Steph, just, just one more point. And, and then, Ian, I'm going to come to you and ask you if it's all right, if we're going to do a bit of future gazing just to wrap up the, the hour. But Steph, just, just on this, I and mean, it's one of the questions that come through about hybrid, because obviously that's the big discussion point now, you know, that work patterns have changed and all the rest of it. And that's kind of what the, this whole series has been about is, okay, so what's the implications of that change? Has, do you think the project you're doing at the moment, for as an example, this kind of office move, has the way that you look at data outside of capability and technological advances, but the kind of approach to data, has it been influenced by the pandemic and people working in a slightly different way? You've, you've already touched on one example there where people are quite comfortable being tracked because they want to know that other colleagues are in and that that was happening because they might not be, whereas in the past, they definitely would, well, they probably would have been. So have you seen other examples where you go, that's interesting now that that's become more important or how would you be judging what what would you be doing to assess whether hybrid working whatever you want to call it is, is working uh so it, it is very much down to the the people sensor the people counters not, right you know what i mean the sensors that we have to to see if we have the right spaces for everybody so this right. is going to be a truly agile building in comparison to what we have here here we have many many desks we have lots of breakout space because it's needed um, but we don't know whether or not people are using spaces because the other bit's full. And so they've then moved into this piece. We need to know what settings people want, what people want from the office to encourage them back into the office. But we also need to make sure that we can, we actually use the data from the surveys as to what people want and how often they want to be in the office. So they want to come in for collaboration. They want to be in about two to three days a week. Obviously, you've got the extremes on both sides. Uh, they want convenience. They want to be able to drop in. They want something that's convenient. So it's about providing those things and then monitoring those spaces to see if they work. And then if they do work and it's a far more successful space than we currently have, then that's the business case for making changes here. Right. So it's it's using that as our test bed um, to, to find out what people truly want from the office and to, to work out which one people are happy with. Are they happy with their home office or their, their truly agile office? What is it they're trying to get from the space when they come in and work with colleagues? 
I guess uh, Yoda made the point earlier on about it, the pandemic accelerating some of these trends. I guess what you're saying there is that it was already happening, but this kind of pandemic is really forefront, foregrounded experiential data and and putting employees at the very centre of that. Um, just we're, we're coming to, to towards the end of our hour, uh, believe it or not. And I just kind of want to touch on future gazing, which is always a very, very... Uh, rocky terrain to get across because no one really wants to go on a recorded webinar and, and tell people what they think is going to happen. Um, but Ian, I'm going to ask you to do that. Um, Ian, where do you think this is all heading? Where do you think the role of data is heading? How do you see it tracking alongside both the profession in terms of its its role and the industry in terms of its contribution to to organisations? A few years ago, we did some work about how people thought about the impact of technology on the future of the workplace profession, facilities management, that kind of stuff. And we, we categorised for ease, we said, you've got gateway technologies, you've got automation technologies, gateway technologies, the existing stuff that we use, BIM, BMS, CAFM, IWS, stuff like that. Then you've got automation technologies, Internet of Things would sit within that. You've got analytics and you've got artificial intelligence and machine learning. So sort of four categories. And we went exploring what people thought about the future. And they said kind of two key things. One is this stuff's going to get more important. And then the other thing they said was, oh, we don't know much about it. And then the, the side thing, which was terrifying, frankly, but nobody seemed to think it was an issue, was they said, but it's all right because our profession's safe because people are always going to need buildings. I was like, this, can you not see the disconnect here in that the world is changing in front of your very eyes? I mean, you're probably going to get excited about, you know, it's the sort of the story of Nokia, isn't it? And it's the story of Kodak and all of that stuff. The yeah. world is changing in front of your very eyes. You're just tickling this stuff, but you don't know a great deal about it. Meanwhile, all of these te technology companies are seeing the opportunity. I mean, look at what has happened with Microsoft, the use of Teams, the rollout of workplace analytics during the last past the, the last couple of years. So, so I feel quite confident to kind of go, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning and analytic capabilities are going to continue to charge forward. Right. There is no stopping that because there's no stopping the commercial value that they contain for organizations, for suppliers of tools that utilize them for organizations. So we got a choice. We either tool up and get involved or we get pushed to one side and we get marginalized as, as service providers and not belittling service providers. I mean, we get kind of basically we just get operationalized because we, we're not capable of being in that strategic conversation. Yeah. So, yeah, it's 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 almost embrace the analytic capability, wrestle with the thorny problems it brings. A lot of the questions were about GDPR and how do we deal with the people stuff? Yes, we can put the building stuff in a box and that's easier to deal with. But we still got to gather data about how people feel, about how people are moving around. There's ways to deal with it. We can aggregate data. We can anonymize data. But we got to wrestle with them thorny problems, because if we don't, somebody else is coming to do it on our behalf and they're getting paid instead. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. You know, I, I remember that report and that kind of sense that we'll always need buildings. Fast forward two years and 50 percent of the world's population is working from their houses for, for two years. So, uh, yeah, I, I guess it, it acts as a bit of a warning shot, doesn't it? A bit of a kind of enforced warning shot. Yoda, I, I kind of want to get the last word from yourself because um, I'm going to ask you to do that, that future gazing. But from a technology point of view, if you don't mind, you know, wh where is, you know, I, I suppose for Luddites like me, we, we sit there and new shiny things come out and we go, Ooh, that looks exciting. That's exciting bit of data. But you'll be aware, I'm sure, of some stuff that's coming down the track that we have not even begun to look at. So what, what is it that you would say to listeners, you know, to look out for interesting developments, because do you know what, it might not feel relevant, but man, it's going to be really relevant. Yeah. So I think one of the things that is going to come quite leaps and bounds is, is, is going to be the scenario planning side. So just as an example, um, it's not quite a network effect, but you know, the more people are in an office, actually, the more it encourages others to come into an office. It's not like five people are in 
and hence it's going to stay static for every person that you add it is actually that there is a different kind of there's a different curve as it were um, in terms of the data because the more dynamic it is the more people want to be part of it whereas the quieter it is everyone else kind of leaves you know um and i think that kind of that part of scenario planning needs to get a lot stronger especially as we get more and more data on these ups and downs so now we've been through a few reopenings and kind of go you know um more working from home and, and so forth and i think we'll see this trend up and down um probably every even next winter i think we'll, we'll get kind of people coming back in spring summer is going to be great and, and 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 kind of and then you know next winter it might be again kind of some some um the numbers might go up so you know kind of people's um might be working more remotely and i think as as that happens and then as people are looking ahead to their leases i think there's going to be some really interesting conversations because the data is just it's just very wavy um and and that bit i'm i'm, I'm excited about as a kind of modeling nerd as, as it were yeah. um and then there's always that question of you know if everyone's coming in at the peak then it's never going to be enough or it's going to be dead like it's either going to be like how do we get that sweet spot where people are comfortably there and you're not hitting ridiculous peaks um but you're also kind of making the office fit for purpose in that collaboration element and 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 not just saying you know oh fridays are quiet so just come in on fridays because that's not yeah. the people are trying to come into the office if that makes sense um it kind of sounds to me that you know some of the things you're talking about it gets my brain ticking around predictive analytics mm -hmm. and you know the sort of the, the size of data sets that we need to smash into one place but you know if steph sat there and it goes do you know what if you can get another three people to into the into this building then we think there's going to be a net effect of you're going to have 300 more people across these two months you know is i know that's a silly example but that's the kind of stuff i guess steph that people want fms want that help with i, I guess it's bridging the gap between some of the skills challenges that ian's talking about and technology doing some of that heavy lifting for us because at the moment i, I guess people just get terrified by big swathes of excel spreadsheets with fifty thousand lines on them and being asked to do something with them right absolutely and then it's the the other aspect of actually trying to um negate those waves so uh, as yoda was saying you know people will come in for other people so you in, you have to then actively give reason for people to come in on those quiet times which people are already considering and already working on because we're not just the waves that we're seeing with the lockdown work from home etc which we are seeing massively and it's amazing how quickly it, the numbers do shoot straight back up again but we're of course seeing it from monday to friday of course yeah yeah well look Guys, thank you so much for, for joining us uh, and sharing your insights and, and your experiences, which are you know really valuable for the people listening. Um, sorry we weren't able to get to all the questions. There's still some coming in. Um, but yeah, that brings us to the end of our webinar. It brings us to the end of this micro series that we've had. So like I say, all the recordings are online, episode one and two. So we've, we've sort of been building up to this one. Um, this episode, it'll be early next week. You'll be able to find that. Again, it'll be on the Open Census website. It'll be in the resources section. They've got a YouTube channel where you can find it on there. Um, so that's all very good. So look, Ian, Yoda, Steph, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I would say to everybody, uh, if you've been interested in what these guys have been talking about, if you're interested in learning more or connecting, everyone's very easy to find on LinkedIn. So, you know, give them a shout and, and connect. Um, same goes for me. Um, I've really enjoyed this series. I hope you have too. And I really hope, I really hope, there's some real practical nuggets you can take away to actually do something in your organization, some, some, you know, make some change, or dare I say, use this as a bit of data to convince someone internally uh, that maybe we need to invest in this stuff, like Steph said. So uh, that's all for now. And cheerio, have a good weekend. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you.